I think few of the very critical points and uh, one of the things that me and Priyanka, we, we realized uh, that there are so many overlaps in terms of these pathways, the strategic line as we are calling them. There are very many, uh, what you call overlaps. So it seems to be four distinctive, four different pathways on internationalization. But over the course of our meetings and everything, and primarily everything has been online, we have realized that many areas are actually overlapping. And as Priyanka was presenting, I was thinking that the area that I wanted to touch upon very quickly is, and uh, uh, again, just to reiterate, all of you have to check your exam copies as well. It won't take much time. Uh, you know, this area essentially also was covered in a bit as a part of her presentation. When she talked about the, the curriculum, she said about the formal, uh, you know, uh, the formal curriculum or the informal curriculum as well as a hidden curriculum. I think if you, if you, uh, if you see it closely, you realize that embedded as a part of these three frameworks, three different parts of the curriculum is where the openness actually is going to come from. So I wanted to quickly take you through it. Uh, won't bore you, I promise. Uh, all of you know very clearly that international education for that matter or education, higher education per se, has changed dramatically. The perspectives that we had in terms of whatever we want to, you know, work it around the cognitive principles, the behavioral principles, as far as education is concerned, has completely changed. The tools that we have been using for education and particularly for international education has, has changed dramatically. Today, you had used to have books and, and, and uh, journals and everything, but today you have so many resources available for professors and for academics to, to be international in their perspectives and stay maybe in a smallest village of India. So I think the, the tools itself have changed big time. And the third part, the fourth part rather, is that the kind of institutions that we used to think that these are the institutions which are primarily the international institutions. These are the places, the schools, colleges, which have an international mindset and they are able to do very well. That particular dimension has, it has flips on it, flipped on its head actually. So today, you cannot say this is an institution which is international in its perspective and this institution is not, it's not so. Because somewhere in the institution which is, seems to be a non-internationalized, there are professors, academics who are teaching a lot of examples, case studies related internationally. So how, how do you then define what is an internationalized institution and what is not? So I think the de definition per se itself has changed. Uh, how do we define this open teaching and learning, international open and teaching versus, versus opposed part of it, versus closed? I think one of the key tenets of openness is as we often say that you need to be where you have an open mindset, I think exactly the same thing pertains to the international openness when it comes to teaching and learning. I think some of the things as JLU we have been doing very, very well. I am aware of the last time our Vice Chancellor when he got uh, uh, what you call uh, learning outcomes and, and TLPs framed properly as part of the NAC. I think a lot of things came up where we realized that we are pretty okay. I mean, we may not be the best in the world, but we are pretty okay when it comes to embedding some international perspectives into our curriculums, into our courses, modules. So I think that's a heartening piece for us. But I think what is still needed as a part of the Rishi, this is what something which came up is, often we kind of, I mean, there are cases, I would not, uh, you know, say that everybody does it, but there have been cases where in trying to be extremely, and allow me to use this word, extremely patriotic, saying that whatever is Indian has to be the best, has, has kind of pushed us back in opening up and picking up cases and examples and benchmarks from other universities. And I'm talking about in a Indian versus international universities. One, so there's a, there's a problem there, right? So we need to be very, very clear about that there's nothing like good and bad and ugly only related to a country and a geography. I think we should be open enough. So that is the basic tenet of it. And second part is another thing also. Often when we do some great benchmarks as far as we are concerned in India, we feel that they, they may not stand the litmus test when it comes to international benchmarks. So we kind of keep it on the back burner, we keep it somewhere as a part of our own dossiers, don't share it. And I'm not always sharing among ourselves, but sharing internationally. So we fail to do that. Now that creates a problem because you're not getting things from outside. You don't, you're not like a sponge as we say, you're not imbibing new things. At the same time, you're not sharing something which you have done which has an international uh, what you call implications of it. We have examples where things have been done in Indian universities by Indian professors and those same examples, same situations have been used exactly like same, I mean apart from changing the names, in university in Brazil and Colombia. 
Now, what do you do that? You don't have to change anything. You just have to change the geography, the nomenclature, and some names here and there. And you can say the same case study which has been used in a university in Brazil. Now, that is also part of the internationalization which we need to keep in mind very clearly. So, key questions, Priyanka, very well covered in terms of what is the internationalization of curriculum and how exactly it kind of aligns itself to the global competencies. And uh, global competencies are like a shifting sand. Today, whatever Priyanka said and shared and whatever you knew earlier as well, come back after maybe six months. We'll have another very interesting workshop. And then we'll discuss another set of competencies which would be different from what Priyanka shared. So I think we need to be very clear in terms of what are international competencies because believe me, it sounds very easy. But when we are, I mean, as JLU, we know that when we have our TLPs very well aligned, we always say that, our students are going to also going to go for higher studies internationally as well. Now, if those competencies are not mapped out in our, in our uh, learning outcomes and our TLPs, I think there's, there's something going to be an issue on that. So that has been covered all together. I just wanted to go quickly on a couple of things. In fact, just the three challenges and opportunities, and we'll close on that. One of the key things that we need to understand is the key challenges which are coming. And, uh, you know, work it on yourself and you realize amongst your colleagues in the university itself outside, you will see the challenges which pertain to the personal person. You would have heard many people in your own colleagues, would have, somebody would have said, look, I'm trying to get my TLPs which are slightly more internationalized in its perspective. And the other person would tell you, it's not necessary. I think we are good enough. We already have a good amount of knowledge within our systems. So why? So that's a personal biases which creep in. So one has to be very wary of it. Personal biases do put a full stop a speed breaker on the internationalization. There's nothing right and wrong in that. Second part is also the cultural. Something you pick up a case study, management, law, media, I know then when we pick up the case studies from international sources, we say, this does not apply to us. Now, we are closed. We are very close in terms of how we are looking at that particular case study. Because case study, if, you, if it, no case study can be applied as it is. You have to kind of align it to your own situations and geographies. So why be culturally biased? So I think the cultural biases do creep in when you talk of openness to the teaching. And the third part is obviously institutional. Institutional pertains to, if you do not have the frameworks of internationalization, no matter what Yash Ma'am does, Yash Ma'am, I singled you out. No matter what Yash Ma'am does, you would not be able to do it and deploy it with your students and with your co-colleagues. So I think the frameworks of institutional are very, very important. Uh, some of the examples are very clearly, uh, you have, you all know about it. You have some curriculums, some courses, some TLPs, which have a very, very international broad output. I've seen uh, one TLP in our university. I would, I mean, it's a domain is a political science. I've seen that actually. It has some excellent examples from different, different countries within Asia. I think that is what we are talking of learning outcomes. And it is all aligned to the learning outcomes. There may be many more which I will not have seen it. Second part is that within the module, you have a course learning outcomes. And then within the module, you can have some aspects of it which can be shown as or documented as and deployed as an international curriculum and international perspectives on it. Obviously, Priyanka did cover about the activities and the way that we go about. I do not know. But I think this is something that we'll have to think about it. Do we have activities which have an international perspective to it? I know some places we do it. I, I've seen some in media, definitely I've seen some of them where when the essays and the, the monographs are written, it has those, you know, beyond India kind of a centric, uh, you know, content into it. I think that is what we are talking about activity and then the assignments around it and obviously assessments. Uh, our rubrics of assessments are pretty good, there's nothing wrong in it, but I think we all know, we have gone through the NEP part of the process of it. I think that now the assessment rubrics, when they come up, see if you are able to integrate those international benchmarks, how the international benchmarks and assessments are being done and align it to our courses. I think that is where the, the kind of examples are coming. And obviously the last point is how do you sustain it? What is, how do you ensure that this keeps on happening over and over again, like an institutionalized, First part is obviously that you need to have a bespoke approach to it. Bespoke approach would mean customize, a specific approach to it. Do not get swayed by internationalization where you say, okay, everything international is good and let me just use it. It cannot be done. If you really want to be internationalized in your perspectives, then bespoke is the way to go. Training, this is part of the training, as we all know. 
although it is coming at a wrong time. But still, the training has to be very important. So, and training does not only mean at the university level. I think within our faculty, with our own colleagues, we should keep on having discussions and debating and keep on documenting because as a university also, it would help us. So, training is important. And the last point is how do we support each other? Uh, look, we know that JLU Office of International Affairs has members from every faculty. And, and they're very senior members, headed by the pro-chancellor and the vice-chancellor. Um, but over the course of time, I have also realized it, is, it does not happen that way. Every faculty, every school in our university since many years has been doing a lot of work when it comes to international integration and partnerships. Institutionally, we have not been able to get, get everything together. But I think it's a high time that we are able to do it. So this support part of it is very important. In fact, one of the things which had come up, and I should mention, uh, this had come up in one of the meetings where Pro-Chancellor sir was there, and I, I think VC sir was also there. It came up was any, any academic in our university who does something when it comes to, and you think that there's something international into it, there's a perspective into it, please document and put a document to it, put a one pager to it and send it across to us. Because if we do not do that, how do we know? Reena ma'am is teaching in a class and she comes up with a brilliant case study which has a great implications on our course and students are given assignments and they are able to turn out a good piece of you know, assets back to, the, to her, but the documentation is not done. In terms of documenting, but from a learning perspective. So if you are able to do it, I think it can become the benchmarks or a dossier of all international efforts that each one of us are doing in our own different way. You don't have to go and do a mega thing. You just have to do a smaller thing. So I think support actually comes from that perspective, which is important. So one of the things you need to keep in mind, and I think that is where the, you know, this, this, this pathway of international open teaching and learning comes very, very strongly on two paths, I always say. One is understand there is more knowledge in the world than you actually know. We all know about it. But we rarely go out and seek it. We rarely go out and, and appropriate it. We rarely go out and actually capture it. And then work hard to turn that particular international perspective, whatever we've got in our own courses and disciplines, turn it into a piece which is relevant for our students. So a student coming from Sihor, if you get them a case study which has come from Harvard Business School, may not, many times may not work, honestly speaking. But I think that's the smartest efficiency of the academic is that can you get the same learnings which the HBS case study has said or talked about and can you convert into a localized piece for the student who has come from Seoul. Now what it would do is to get the benchmark which is internationalized back to the student who has come from a rural or a village in India, maybe in urban also, and would give them a perspective. So tomorrow when what Priyanka said, when the competencies are being mapped, that students should be up to it in terms of, you know, saying that I am also competent in terms of these aspects, which are globalized, which are internationalized. So I think that is where this particular mindset. And second is please uh, also ensure that we do not become biased in terms of what we are seeking out to. Uh, it is not necessary to give international examples. I'm not saying that's not internationalized. Internationalization is where you are able to take the best practice out if it is aligned, deployed as it is, go ahead and do it. If it is not, then of course you can change it and do something else. Uh, we have done few things right, so I'm not going on it. We have definitely consulted key stakeholders. When we do the BOS, the key stakeholders are being kind of, you know, deliberated and discussed and consultations. I do not know. Uh, I, I'm sure that some of you would be doing it. If you're also consulting international experts around the courses that you're talking, and if you're taking into account as part of your BUS and part of the TLPs and curriculum development, I think that's superb. If not, I think there's a lesson we should also do, even if they're not part of the BUS. When you do the course development committee CDCs, I think you should involve international experts in the areas that you're working. It would help you to grow and integrate international because they would have different perspective. Secondly, uh, VC sir has said many times, and many times you have been able to do it also, I think this alignment with the competencies what Priyanka talked about is absolutely must if you really want to have your TLPs and curriculums internationalized in terms of it. And obviously the last part is, as and again she, she kind of pointed towards it, having learning outcomes is one part, having internationalized learning outcomes is another part. If you know the competencies, if you can map it and embed it as a part of a learning outcome, so even as one line, then you can say that my TLP for this particular course is, has an international learning outcome as well. The moment you have that, as academics, all of us would have to get into the class 
and figure it out how am I going to you know do justice to that learning outcome which is internationalized which means everything what we had discussed earlier would come back to you and you'll have you'll push yourself to do those things right and second is obviously uh, which is a block two which is a second part of it which we are not going to cover today is this building up internationalized and internationally relevant degrees in fact there's always a, already a conversation I believe in management I know um, in I think management uh, humanities law and media we are already doing a pathways degrees this year when the admissions start you would have in at least in each of the faculty this is what I've heard from VC Sir and uh, Prochan Sir each at least all at least four of these uh, faculties would have at least one degree program which would have an international pathway embedded into it so which means two years in India and one year in internationally but now understand you can create that degree very well I know that all of us are competent but what would you do in the first two years? Your students, when they go there in the third year, they'll say, wow, now in the great place to study. But if you've done a good job, which where means your degree has been internationalized, your process has been internationalized, you have given them so much that they have a smooth process of integrating themselves in the third year. Whether it is a semester abroad or it is the in last year completely, you will have to do it. So that's something that we want to cover up in a separate way altogether. That's a bigger piece of work where I'm sure that Vice Chancellor Sir would have a great, uh, you know, kind of a, a torch to show to us, right? Uh, this I have already covered, this unions. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.